So what do I want to do with the remaining uh, lectures? So today I want to talk about credibility theory, which is an example of a posteriori pricing or experience rating. So that means we're going to take the history of claims reported by the policyholder. We're going to take that into account in our pricing model. And this credibility theory framework, this is also used uh, to price products, insurance products, for example, a workers' compensation insurance product, where it is not so easy or not so common to have a lot of rating factors available, right? So, so we focused previously more on the, let's say, motor insurance products, where you can collect a lot of characteristics of your uh, policyholders. Um, so here we've got a framework where we can also do some, some modeling and try to get our hands on an assessment of the expected uh, claim frequency or the expected um, uh, loss on a contract, even if we do not have uh, a lot of characteristics, observable characteristics available, right? It's also going to touch a bit on, on Bayesian calculations. So if you've not seen that before, we're going to do some Bayesian uh, statistics or Bayesian uh, kind of thinking in the very specific context of modeling the number of claims with a Poisson distribution and then mixing with a gamma uh, random effect. Yeah? So I'm also going to connect to what we learned in the loss models course. You'll see that kind of calculations uh, coming back here. Um, I've got a deck of sheets available. I also got an extra note available where I do some of the more um, uh, lengthy calculations where I put those together, but I'll try to, to work through some of them on the iPad uh, together with you as well. I've got two boys at home who do not have to go to school and will be very disappointed to find out that I took the iPad with me, um, which will uh, avoid that they can play uh, Brawl Stars uh, in the morning, but okay. Um, so that's the plan for today. And then last week, I'll devote the last session to the topic of claims reserving. All right? So that's a bit um, the plan. Yeah? We're all good to go? Let's get started then. So credibility theory. I'm hoping this is going to work. Right. So if you look at the lecture sheets, well, in fact, these lecture sheets are based on a chapter from this book, Actuarial Modeling of Claim Counts, where I essentially cover uh, this uh, set of pages, right? So if you want to uh, look that up or if you want to read the full story behind the sheets, I recommend you to the, to the reference on, on the right. So what is our, what is our goal? We want to set a premium. Huh? So it's still about pricing. Huh? It's about determining the technical uh, premium or the technical price of a particular type of contract. And the traditional motivation for a credibility uh, framework to be used is that you've got a group of insurance contracts and you've got the experience for each of those insurance contracts and you somehow want to find a balance between using the experience, so the, the history yeah, that you recorded on one of these contracts particularly, and you also want to use the experience that you collected on the whole group of contracts. And you sort of want to find a good balance between using the experience of the group, uh, uh, of, the, of the contract itself, and the experience on a larger group of related contracts. Yeah? So we're going to use the, theoretic, the credibility theory to, to balance this. So for example, in a workers' compensation insurance product, this is being used because you issue a contract to a specific company, but that company can be, for example, a construction work company. Uh, so what you want to do then is you want to use um, what you learned from companies working in a similar branch of industry, construction work, right? And you want to uh, also use the, the experience that you have on companies uh, doing similar work, but, but, but perhaps a bit less related, right? So in industry context, you would have uh, branches of industry and you would have li larger uh, sectors of, of industry. So within construction, you can have people who are doing the, 
uh, the bricklaying, right? And you've got other companies doing the electricity work. So there you see some similarities, uh, but also some uh, specific characteristics. So this is a way, a mathematical framework to sort of um, balance these different pieces of information that you have available. So we'll see how that goes. So more formally, in a first and simple example, we would consider claim history, call it XJT, could be frequency, could be the total loss on a contract, but we've got claim history XJT, where J is running over the different contracts that we have, and T is running over time periods. Yeah, so a couple of years that we follow these contracts. And the overall goal is, uh, how should we determine the technical premium, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to talk about technical premiums, of course, for the next year. So how are we, how can we assess the expected value of xj t plus 1, let's say. And how can we combine here the individual experience of contract j with the collective experience where we followed uh, all these contracts, huh, all j's over time. How can we balance these two pieces of information. And historically, this was motivated uh, once again by an example of workers' compensation insurance uh, with General Motors in the United States. So General Motors said to its insurance company, yes, but we spend a lot of time and effort on safety measures. So we should get, or we expect to get a lower insurance premium for our workers' compensation uh, policy. Uh, in contrast to other companies huh, who don't invest in safety measures and so on. So they kind of forced their insurance company to look at their own experience in terms of uh, number of accidents at work, right? And they wanted the insurance company to use their own statistics over time to base the premium on, instead of using a global data set uh, collected over multiple countries, where the experience of General Motors was mixed huh, with uh, experience of, of other companies investing less effort and money in safety measures. So that's a little bit the, um, the topic that we're going to talk about here. Huh? So how can we use experience, claim history, statistics uh, of, of, of one particular contract, of a group of similar contracts, and perhaps also of a bigger group of contracts? How can we balance these different pieces of information. You can take two extreme positions. You can say, I'm going to charge the same premium to everybody, so I'm going to use one big data set and I'm going to treat everybody as uh, contributing equally, right? And I'm going to charge like a global average somehow. Or I'm going to charge to group J, think about General Motors, huh? its own a premium based on its own specific average or statistics XJ bar. So we want to find a mathematical framework that helps us to determine how much weight should we get, should we give to the first bullet, and how much weight should be given to the second bullet here. So what are some drawbacks of both um, approaches? If you do X bar, it only makes sense for a homogeneous portfolio. Uh, it only makes sense if you have uh, companies who all look very similar and who take for example, in the workers' compensation insurance contract, we take similar measures in terms of safety, the kind of activity that they do, etc. Right? But if you, uh, if you charge the same premium for all the companies, and if not all the companies are the same, we know that there is the uh, risk of being faced with adverse selection. Good risks leaving, bad risks will stay. If you charge XJ bar, then, of course, you have to keep in mind that this can be a very volatile estimate. If you have not much experience on contract J, then charging XJ bar might not be such a good idea, right? So this is only, can only be used if you have sufficient volume, sufficient weight, sufficient uh, exposure for this group J's uh, claims experience. So the what we, in the very traditional setting of, actuary, of credibility uh, theory, what we denote with credibility theory, is a way to find the so-called credibility factor, X, uh, sorry, ZJ. So the weight that we should allocate to 
the group's uh, own experience and the weight we should allocate to the global average. So this is in a very traditional way what actuaries have been referring to as credibility theory. So a, a framework to come up with this expression for the premium to be charged technically on contract J as a balance, as a weighted average of the contract's own experience and the group's global experience. We're going to see the, f the mathematical framework slightly different, so I'm going to stick to kind of uh, Bayesian calculations where I do Poisson gamma um, credibility. This kind of thinking is sort of a linear approximation to that framework, right? Uh, so you could do several classes on credibility theory. I'm not going to do that. So I just want to give you um, like the kind of thinking, the main kind of thinking, but do know that then there are several ways how you can set this up mathematically. You can go for really a Bayesian implementation. You can go for linear approximations. There are several directions you can take, right? So why are we doing this. Huh? I already gave the example of General Motors saying, yeah, wait a minute, uh, insurance company, we have very good statistics, uh, we want you to take that into account, and we don't want to be mixed with our competitors who have uh, worse statistics because they invest less money in safety, etc. So, of course, you could say, yeah, can't we measure that with some observable risk factors, huh? like we've been doing in the a priori pricing so far. So credibility is about what is there, uh, what kind of heterogeneity is there left despite the factors that we can take into account by collecting some information on our policyholder or on our contract. Uh, so in a motor insurance example, if we apply the credibility there, it would refer to yeah, how much heterogeneity is left and cannot be captured by the fact that we already know your age, the kind of car you drive, where you live, your gender, etc., etc. So it can be, or an example in a motor insurance contract could then be how aggressive are you as a driver, how swift are your reflexes as a driver, right? So these are stuff that we cannot really put into some covariates that, or covariate or risk statistic that we can ask our policyholders uh, about when they sign up the contract. And this is about heterogeneity that is coming from non-observable characteristics. And of course, with the whole um, upswing of telematics, black box uh, devices, collection of driving information, this kind of heterogeneity, this driving style can be collected to a certain extent. Huh? If you have information, on the driving style, on the, the way how your uh, driver um, corners or, or how he's using um, the brake, uh, etc. So that can reveal part of this heterogeneity. Huh? So with the telematics, we're a little bit in between this pure a priori setting and this a posteriori rating. Now, the whole idea in credibility is that this kind of heterogeneity is going to be revealed through the history of our policyholder. So the way or the number of claims you reported in the past is going to be an indication of this riskness that, is not, that cannot be captured by observable characteristics. Yeah? So a famous uh, professor in actuarial science once said, yeah, the best predictor for what's going to happen in the next year is the number of claims you reported in the past. Uh, it's not going to be your age or your gender or whatever. That's all a kind of proxy, huh, that we, uh, proxy information that we try to collect. But the best predictor is what we observed in the past on this contract. Of course, for pricing a new contract, huh, we cannot use this history uh, except through the level of the bonus malus scale that you um, occupied with your former insurance company, uh, for example. But this is this is what we're thinking about. Yeah? So how can we integrate the claim history? So this history, as I already explained, reveals hidden features. Uh, we're going to adjust the premium based on the individual claims experience. And that's a way to restore actuarial fairness 
among policyholders, huh? because we charge our policyholders a certain a priori premium, and then we should also, uh, if, if when, when history unfolds over time, we can see, oh, we charged Lenny too much uh, for the actual risk that she is representing. So we should restore the fairness by giving her a discount based on the fact that she didn't report any claim in the past, for example. Uh, and with season, perhaps the situation is the other way around, just to give an example. Uh, so we, could, we should give him a penalty then based on the history of claims uh, he reported. So it's a way to rebalance. Yeah? So with the a priori uh, premium table or tariff table, you said, okay, that's my uh, average uh, risk, this is a high risk, this is a low risk, etc. And then when the history of claims unfolds over time, you could see, oh, we made a bit of a, we made kind of a mistake with this policyholder should give discount or the other way around. So we're so, sort of rebalancing this premium volume. Yeah? I want to give one additional example. Uh, maybe I'll try to sketch that on, on the iPad just to make sure that I can say at home that I didn't take it uh, just for nothing, but that there was a real reason. Huh? So if you look at this um, credibility theory, so some other uh, examples. Um, well, first example I want to sketch is a paper I did uh, in my PhD. And there the example was as follows. We had, what was it again? Uh, we had several insurance companies. in one data set, right? And each of those insurance companies was issuing several fleet contracts. So fleet 1-1, one, one, fleet 1-P1, uh, one one, let's say, and here something similar. And a fleet contract, this could be a taxi company having several vehicles under the same contract uh, being covered, right? And Within each of that, um, I think the example was like that, but it's a while ago, eh? it goes back to 2007. Uh, we have several um, vehicles, several drivers, let's say. And each of those drivers was followed over time. Time one up to time T or something. You see the structure coming up? Any idea how we call such a data set in statistics? This is, um, psychologists uh, love that a lot, or people studying like the performance of pu pupils, like students over time in classes and classes belonging to schools, right? So if you then wanna follow the performance of your students, um, within a certain class, within a certain school, then you also have this kind of structure. And we call it in statistics a multi-level data set because there are several levels in this data set. Or another way to refer to this is a hierarchical data set. Right? So you have several levels here, the level company, fleet, driver, time. These are the different levels. And you've got characteristics which are observable at each of those levels. For example, you can collect um, the size of the fleet, uh, the size of the taxi company, uh, whether they only have one car or whether they manage uh, 200 cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the reason why the credibility comes into play is that at each of those levels, you may have unobservable characteristics that you will try to somehow take into account. And the unobservable characteristics are, for example, Leni is managing this fleet, so she's the fleet manager here, 
And Arne is the fleet manager, no, sorry, so, so she's the fleet manager here, for example, this company, and Arne is the fleet manager here, right? But Leni is a very tough boss, so her drivers have to drive all the time, and, you know, the, uh, the vehicles are a bit outdated, etc., etc. And Arne is a very uh, compassionate boss, so he really respects all the, you know, the rules, etc. It's just to give an example. Huh? But what we then um, expect to see is perhaps that in Leni's company there are more claims or more, you know, small things huh, to be reported to the insurance company compared to, to Arne. So there is the unobservable Leni effect and the unobservable Arne effect. So we can take that into account by what we will call uh, a hidden, a hidden random variable, uh, a theta for Arne, a theta for Leni, and we'll estimate this theta in a Bayesian way by taking the history of claims reported into account. Yeah? So it's what econometricians call, um, uh, no, I forgot how, uh, a random effect, but econometricians have a different term for it, I forgot. So we'll have a random effect at the level for each fleet, for each driver, for each company, which can then take hidden characteristics uh, into account. All right? So that's what we will see, and we'll see it today in a basic setting. Huh? So this would be more advanced if you want to do this, you will have to go indeed to, to Bayesian statistics or to some kind of dual hierarchical credibility model, but one, one can do it. it, it exists. And in fact, I would say that on the Belgian market, it's uh, used, particularly if you look at the pricing of uh, a workers' compensation insurance. Because there we start from industry or blue color versus white color industry as a whole. So blue versus white color activities. And then within the blue colors, you may have um, different, yeah, let's call it um, classes, but sometimes the terminology is different, and then different groups of activities. Or the other way around, uh, you can refer to a group and then a class uh, within that. And then you'll have different contracts, so different companies, uh, which you follow over time. Yeah, so here you can have a company, and you follow this company over time. So it's again a hierarchical data set. And this structure of the data really should be taken into account. Yeah? And it's not straightforward to do this with um, fixed effects or observable effects. It's um, because what we especially try to capture at, the, at each of those levels is the heterogeneity, the, the stuff that we cannot um, capture in an observable characteristic. Yeah? It could be a company ignoring safety measures, or it could be a very dangerous activity, working activity that this company is operating in. And that will drive, to a certain extent, the claim experience on this, uh, on this type of contract. So you'll see also in the, in the practice on the, on the Belgian market and beyond, that to price such a workers' compensation insurance, this idea of credibility theory is, is used. a little bit clear yeah? to, to give some examples here. And yeah, now I know how econometricians call it. So we refer to it as a random effect. If you're a biostatistician, you would say I, I allocate a random effect to each of those levels. As an econometrician, you would say I use a latent variable. Uh, um, so these are two ways to refer to a non-observable random variable to capture the, the riskness that we cannot express in terms of a priori 
characteristics. Right? So that's what we want to work with in this example. Yeah? I also want to say that this is an example <laughs> where all this machine learning and fancy data science, etc., you really need old school stuff to do this. Huh? Because if you, uh, I think if you go for like a gradient boosting machine, etc., good luck with trying to capture this uh, structure. Huh? People will use like embeddings perhaps or some kind of encodings. But I still believe that there is a lot of um, added value from the more traditional actuarial mathematics or the more th traditional statistics to do this uh, compared to the uh, machine learning approach. Yeah. So they, um, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a nice uh, case where you see that there is a um, really added value of the of the statistical learning as as we know it. All right. So we covered this, here we are. So what is credibility theory? It's a tool, it's a framework to deal with um, heterogeneous collectives, uh, where the heterogeneity is coming from uh, aspects that we cannot directly uh, observe. We want to determine premiums for such contracts in a heterogeneous portfolio, combining individual collective experience. And this is typically used when there is limited or irregular claim experience for each contract, but you've got claim experience for the whole portfolio. It's a set of quantitative tools that will allow the insurer to do what is called experience rating. Yeah, so that means uh, taking your claim experience into account to adjust the technical price. Okay, so there are several ways how you can use it. You can use it if you have this hierarchically structured data set and you want to work with that, or in a motor insurance context, you could say, I want to use this framework to do the ex experience rating, so I want to have a tool available that can take the history of claims reported by my policyholder into account. This is also why we say that this credibility theory, it's in fact the theoretical framework underneath a bonus-malus scale. So a bonus-malus system is, is, is a kind of commercial um, translation of what the credibility framework is doing. Yeah. Now, if you look at the actuarial literature, two types of credibility mechanisms have been proposed there, and this goes back to the beginning of the 20th century, so it's very old. We have limited fluctuations, greatest accuracy credibility. I don't want to cover the first bullet. Yeah, so it's kind of, I mean, it, did not have such a, uh, did not catch a lot of attention in actuarial literature. So we're going to focus on the second uh, bullet. And you see that this goes back a very long time uh, to the beginning of the 20th uh, century. Yeah? So here is what we're going to do. We're going to look at tariff cells. So tariff cells, that's what you also constructed in your assignment. Huh? You make a tariff table, you say, okay, uh, I've got a certain risk profile determined by this and this and this characteristic, and I can say something about the expected number of claims on this um, risk profile. I can say something about the expected claim severity. But what we're going to do now is we're going to assume that even though we made such a tariff table, there is still some heterogeneity left in these cells. Uh, think again about the example we gave, Leni and Arne can belong to the same tariff cell, but still there are differences between the two of them. Yeah? Things we cannot capture in an observable characteristic. And we're gonna introduce a random variable, theta, or a risk parameter, or a latent variable, or um, a random effect, in order to reveal this heterogeneity to us by looking at the posterior distribution of this theta given the history of claims reported by Leni, by, by Arne. So Leni will get such a parameter, Arne will get a parameter, and we're gonna see how that uh, posterior distribution of that parameter reveals, uh, re will reveal to us, right? 
So it's not observable. So we'll, we're going to draw these risk parameters from a common distribution. So I'll have a common distribution, and from that distribution, I will give a theta for Arne, I will get a theta for Leni. Yeah. We're going to estimate the theta from the data using the Bayesian thinking. Now, what is the advantage? Because you could say, yeah, but I could also have um, uh, determined like a fixed effect, so covariate for Leni, a dummy variable for Leni, and a dummy for, for Arne. But then I would have to estimate a lot of parameters, because I would have to estimate uh, each such parameter for all my uh, drivers. Whereas here, in this kind of thinking, the only thing I need to do is to estimate the parameters from this common distribution. And from that kind of thinking, in a Bayesian way, I'll then can come up with the posterior expectation, for example, of this theta parameter. So it's made way more simple, and it's also more stable. Huh? If you would have a dummy variable for Leni and one for Arne, and if your experience uh, Leni is very small, very short, then I can get a very volatile estimate for your dummy variable. Whereas here, it's way more balanced uh, by the fact that I have this common distribution, and then draw a random variable, a risk parameter for each of my policyholders from this common distribution. So it's really like we're going to use this Bayesian thinking to do the estimation. And as such, our premium becomes the product of a base premium and a credibility coefficient. So the base premium is what we can express based on our observable characteristics, and the credibility coefficient is the correction we're going to do on top of that base premium by taking into account the history that we observed on our contracts. Right? So the base premium is a function of the current rating factors, and the credibility coefficient is a function of the history of claims at fault, of course, and we call it a, a posteriori premium correction. So if the correction factor is above one, we give you a penalty. Uh, we say, okay, we were too low in our a priori assessment. You need to be charged a higher premium if your um, correction factor is below one, we give you a discount um, based on good experience in the past. That's the idea. And what we're often going to do is assume that these are posteriori corrections uh, average to one, in the sense that we don't change the overall premium volume as such. We just tell, okay, some people need to go higher and some others need to go lower. It's kind of a rebalancing without changing the total premium volume that we calculated. So what I want to do now is with a sort of stylized example, we're going to show how this type of calculations uh, works. And we're considering a very simple model where we have two types of drivers, good drivers and bad drivers. And we're going to get information about whether you are rather a good or rather a bad driver through the history of claims that you report over time. So we consider 60% of our policyholders to be good drivers. And the probability that a good driver uh, reports K claims during a certain insurance period is Poisson with a given lambda uh, of 5%. And on the other hand, 40% of the policyholders are bad drivers, with the probability that a bad driver reports K claims being lambda B, where the lambda B is 15%. Yeah? So this is uh, the kind of this, the setting in our insurance um, policy portfolio, sorry. And we say that, well, a priori, we cannot distinguish between the good and the bad drivers because we consider that to be hidden characteristics which um, we can only try to capture over time by looking at the history of the claims. So a priori we cannot distinguish. So a priori what we charge is the expected value of n, where n is the number of claims. And when calculating this expected value of n, I can follow the following um, reasoning. I can say, well, how should I look at the global average, the global expected number of claims in my portfolio? Then I'm going to look at this conditional, or this tower rule, in fact. Huh? I'm going to condition on Z, 
and I'm going to take the expected value of this conditional expectation, where the first expected value is going to go over z, right? So what do I get? I say that with a certain probability, I'm a good driver. And what I get then is the expected value of n given that I'm a good driver, that's the lambda g, plus with a certain probability, I'm a bad driver. And then I'll use the expected value of n given that I'm a bad driver. And that's going to be lambda b. So taken together, I've got a global portfolio average of 9% in this case. Yeah, so that's what I would charge, or that's what would be my assessment. A priori, if I cannot distinguish between who is a good driver and who is a bad driver, if I'm only relying on the global information that I have with, okay, I've got a 40% versus 60% population with bad drivers versus good drivers, and they each have their dedicated uh, lambda. Yeah, so that this would be the situation to start from. But now, over time, I could say, yeah, what's the probability of being a good driver, given that you reported k claims during the first year? So if history becomes available uh, over time, how can I then change my probabilities of you know, having a good driver versus having a bad driver? So what we're going to do is a kind of... yeah. Bayesian calculation, so we're going to use a conditional probability and we want to know what's the probability of being a good driver given that you reported k claims in the previous um, policy period. So what you do is you apply the Bayes theorem, you say that conditional probability can be written as such, and if you look here at the probability of being a good driver and reporting k claims, that can be rewritten as such, and if you look here at the probability of reporting k claims, you can use the law of total probability and rewrite it as such, right? So now we can bring in uh, everything we know. We know the probability of being a good driver. We also know the probability of reporting k claims given that you're a good driver because we know that that follows a Poisson distribution with lambda g, and we can also uh, write down the probability of reporting k claims given that you're a bad driver because that follows a Poisson distribution with lambda b, right? So I can plug in all the expressions and I can calculate these probabilities because in this stylized example I know uh, the probability of being good, being bad, I know the dedicated lambdas, etc. Yeah? So we can check the probabilities in the table not the table below, but uh, this table. So here you see, let's picture somebody who reports zero claims in the first year. So let's say that the k is zero, and let's calculate these conditional probabilities, right? So uh, I have the expression here for being a good driver given k claims, and then of course the complement is the probability of being a bad driver given k claims. So we see that if you reported zero claims in year one, the probability that we're dealing with a good driver increases from 60% to 62%. And if you report uh, zero claims in the first year, the probability of having a bad driver decreases from 40% to 37%. Because reporting zero claims is more in line with the good driver behavior than it is with the bad driver behavior. And you see, if you reported, for example, five claims in this first year, the probability that you are a good driver really drops uh, to um, approximately 0.7%, uh, and the probability that we're dealing with a bad driver heavily increases. Yeah? Because we say, yeah, the fact that we know something about the claim history reported in the first year, that really uh, tells us something about whether this is rather a good driver or rather a bad driver, right? And we call these a posteriori probabilities because we use the previous, um, we use information from uh, a previously observed uh, claim period or insurance period. 
So a posteriori, the actuary knows the number k of claims reported during the first year. So what he can do is he can adjust his a priori assessment by taking this information into account. And we can also calculate the expected value for n given the claim history from the first year. And how are we going to do that? Again, by using this tower rule. And now, of course, our probabilities change because our probabilities become conditional probabilities. So the probability of being good, given that you reported K claims, and the probability of being a bad driver, given that you reported K claims. And if you fill that in, you see I got the numbers over here. You see that we started with 9% on average. And now, uh, if we reported zero claims, that expected value will drop to 8.7%. If you reported five claims, that expected value will increase to approximately 15%. Yeah? So we can do an a posteriori assessment in this uh, very basic example. Now, if you look at uh, this stylized example, good driver, bad driver, how would you translate that? into the realistic setting of using your a priori tariff table. Where would you get the lambdas and where would you get um, the probabilities? This is an exam question I often use. I ask you to do the calculations for such a stylized example and then I'll ask as a final sub-question now, how would you leverage that to the uh, really the case of an a priori tariff? Where would you get the lambdas and where do you get the corresponding probabilities? Because here I gave them to you. Huh? I said good drivers, 60%, and they have the following lambda. Where would you get that? Yeah, but that's too vague. What did you do in the assignment that you're doing? Yeah, you calculated the mean. You did expected frequency times expected severity. Let's focus only on the frequency part. You put together a model that said, for these characteristics, that's the expected value. Agree or not? So you've got lambdas for me. Uh, you've got not two lambdas, but you've got a whole series of lambdas saying, okay, uh, this particular profile, that's the lambda. This particular profile, that's the lambda. And on top of that, for the portfolio, you can also calculate this particular profile. That's my volume in terms of exposure. So you can say, you can give me a probability, uh, how much, which percentage of my portfolio corresponds to that particular value of lambda. So you've got the whole thing in a more realistic setting based on the a priori model that you put together. And now, if experience reveals over time, and if you're willing to make this Poisson assumption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you could do, um, with the Bayesian statistics, you could do the calculations on how these, uh, yeah, on how these posterior probabilities would, um, would reveal, uh, depending on the claim history that is reported. So the realistic setting is that these lambdas come from your a priori table and these probabilities come from yeah, how is your risk um, spread over these different uh, profiles that you put together in the a priori tariff uh, table. And this is just a very simple, um, very simple setting, very simple, uh, very simple case of that a priori uh, model. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Eh? You've got, in fact, everything. Good. So now we want to leverage this. Huh? So now I'm really going to go into the Bayesian style calculations. Mm -hmm. I'm going to consider a portfolio with n policies, each observed during TI periods. Yeah, because some of my policyholders, they just entered my portfolio while some others have been with me for 10 years or something. So the number of, the, the, the size of the history that I have available, that depends on, that changes, that can be different across policies. 
will denote with NIT the number of claims reported by policyholder I in year T. So year one, that means from time zero to time one. Uh, year two, that's from time one to time two, etc. I know that the expected value of NIT is lambda IT. Where is that coming from? A priori tariff. And of course, my characteristics can change over time, so that a priori assessment can also change over time. So it's indexed with both an I and a T. And the fact that I use the T refers to I use your characteristics for that particular year or particular insurance period. Time zero, I issue the contract, let's assume that. And I've got a nested structure or a hierarchical structure to a certain extent. I've got each policyholder generating a sequence of random variables, ni. So that's a vector, ni1 up to ni ti. The vector with the observed claim numbers. I will assume independence. So my policyholders are independent from each other. This is also um, the reason. Yeah, no, let's... Um, no, let's, let's come back to that later. So I'm going to assume independence huh, between the different policy holders, the contracts in my portfolio. But I'm not going to assume independence within this vector. Agree? Why not? Yeah, it's Arne that I'm following, right? It's still Arne, and that's not independent from each other over time. Huh? That's the whole idea, that there is some... Um, something specific, yeah, something that I cannot directly capture uh, through an observable covariate, but which creates dependence within this vector ni that I observe for my policyholder. And the same applies uh, in the example that I gave for the fleets or for the uh, insurance, um, the branches in industry. There is dependence within the observations that you have within a certain fleet, because it's Lenny who manages everybody, and that creates a certain dependence across all the cars covered by the fleet. So that's also the reason why these random variables are used, to, to structure that dependence and to capture that dependence to a certain extent. So there is a positive dependence expected inside the NIs, right? You can debate about that. Eh? You could say, yeah, but perhaps Arne is learning over time. Huh? Uh, so there people can, can do different things, but uh, we'll assume in this um, mathematical setting that there is some positive dependence expected inside uh, DNIs. So here is my policy I within a portfolio. I'll have my ends, my, in this case, claim frequency random variables over time. And on top of that, I allocate a random variable, a risk parameter theta i, to this contract i. So Arne gets his risk parameter, Bruno gets one, uh, etc. Yeah. At the portfolio level, these sequences are assumed to be independent across the different uh, i's. And this risk parameter represents the risk proneness of policyholder i. Yeah, and I'm going to repeat it again and again because I, I hope it makes things uh, more clear. And I'm sorry for those who are in the room, but I'm going to use you <laughs> as an example. Uh, so this is a summary of Arne's unknown risk characteristics. That's the theta Arne that we're going to try to capture. So given um, a value for this theta, I'm going to assume that the random variables are assumed to be independent. So the dependence across these NITs is really because they all share the same theta. Yeah? And given that I know the theta, I'm going to assume that the NITs become independent. So given that I know these hidden characteristics, I'm going to assume that the series of uh, random variables, the time series of random variables, becomes independent. So that's something I forgot to mention, but this is in fact a collection of short time series huh, that you uh, collect. Because you follow each of us over time, over a couple of years, and you put that all together in a data set. Huh? So you learned on time series modeling with my colleagues. 
in, in other courses. But here it's a slightly different setting. We have a collection of n rather short time series that we are going to work with. Yeah? So we're going to work with the Poisson credibility model. So I'm thinking of claim frequencies. So I'm going to assume a Poisson distribution for them, uh, for these random variables, with this uh, latent variable inside. Of course, if you're working with a total claim amount or something, then you should rather go for a 3D distribution or a normal distribution. Or so. it, really, it depends a bit on the kind of concept that you're modeling. But here we have claim frequencies in mind. So we do the Poisson credibility model. We represent each contract with this sequence, where theta i, I'm going to assume it to be a positive random variable with unit mean, capturing the unexplained heterogeneity. So why do I do a positive random variable with unit mean? That's something I still have to explain. That's because of the way how I'm going to use this theta in my conditional mean for my Poisson. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that given that the theta is equal to theta, I've got a Poisson distribution with a parameter lambda it multiplied with theta. So if I multiply with theta, that thing has to be positive, of course. Otherwise, you would get a negative mean in your Poisson. I'm going to assume it to have unit mean. That has to do with the fact that uh, the posterior average should be equal to the a priori average in the portfolio. That's this thing where I said, yeah, we're going to charge some of us a bit extra, but some others, we're going to give them a reduction. And on average, globally, we're going to assume that there is no change in the premium volume being collected. That's the idea of forcing them to have unit, unit mean, uh, so that the penalties and the discounts balance each other uh, out. That's an assumption we make, but it's because we believe uh, that the premium volume that we charged a priori, that that's a good volume, uh, that we make sure we have an appropriate volume for the portfolio as a whole, and that the a posteriori corrections are just about restoring the fairness uh, in between the different profiles. So that's my unit mean. Why is that? Because tower rule, I assume that the lambda IT was a good assessment for my expected value of NIT. So the correction that I'm making in between should have a unit mean. This is another question that I often ask on the exam. Uh, explain why this, what the, uh, the, the why, that, so one of the sub-questions is then typically, yeah, why this theta, why does it have to be positive, have unit mean, what's the reasoning uh, behind? Are we good with this setting? And can we see that this is like a mathematical translation of the kind of thinking that we've been building up? Yeah? Okay. So once again, why do I not just do like a dummy variable to indicate this is Leni, this is Arne, because the history that I have can be very short. And if I do a dummy variable, I will have to estimate a lot of parameters. And some of these parameters will be estimated with a very um, small precision, with a very large uncertainty because I have limited experience on your contract. But if I let these thetas be random variables, then I only have to care, in fact, about their joint distribution, and I only have to estimate the parameters from this joint distribution. Uh, so that makes it statistically a way more interesting way to uh, capture these policy effects. So a few words about the dependence. Um, the dependence between the annual claim numbers is a consequence of having them shared the same theta. Uh, so we say, because it's our same policyholder, that's what the dependence, uh, that's what's creating the dependence. With a complete knowledge of the policy characteristics, theta would be deterministic. There would be no more dependence between the NIT. So if we really could measure everything, aggressiveness, uh, driving style, uh, everything, 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 then we wouldn't need this framework. Uh, we need this framework because there are lots of things we cannot 
measure, observe, whatever. So there is a hidden heterogeneity. Hidden heterogeneity or unexplained heterogeneity. Revealed by the policyholder's history in a Bayesian way. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify the distribution of theta. And as such, we're going to modify the premium. And we're going to look at the posterior distribution of the theta, the theta given the history we observed on this policyholder. And that's also what we did in this example with the good driver and the bad driver. There we also changed the probability of being good, being bad, based on the claim history reported. And that's where the Bayesian stuff comes into play. So far, so good? Danny? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question because it depends on the uh, example. And maybe I... Malé, that is unbelievable. Eh? That system here. Eh? I'm talking in Dutch because I'm expressing my frustration about the lights. <laughs> so I switched to wireless because I want to do the iPad and then the whole thing. Uh, allez. So um, yeah, I'm just going to wait one second because it creates a lot of noise uh, with, these, uh, with these things coming down. All right. Um, all right. So, Lenny, that's uh, a good question because the example that we're going to treat. So the example that we're going to treat in the, in the course notes is a, a, a simplistic, um, is a simple setting where we're going to say I've got, let's say, one portfolio, so one product, uh, one company. And in this portfolio, I have several um, policy holders, right? And each of them followed over time. Time TI, policyholder I, right? And that's the setting that we're going to look into. So in fact, there are there is only one relevant level to put hidden heterogeneity, and that is the level of my policyholder. That's where I'm going to define my theta I. Uh, so it's, it's Lenny, it's Arne, it's Season, it's me, etc. But then you're correctly referring to um, the, the previous example is, is, or the example that I explained on the iPad with, with the fleets and, and with the workers' uh, compensation insurance, that's more, more difficult, right? Because what I'll have there is, um, for example, here, I will have a theta for company C within group G. And here I'll have a theta for group G. So what, I, what is going to happen? The more levels I have, the more of these thetas I will create. Because um, I could say that a company, and, I, and yeah, I should have had the classes as well, so it would be something like this, in fact. So there is a theta at the class level that captures some dependence between all the contracts in the specific class. Then there is a theta that corresponds to a certain group within a certain class. And then there is a theta that captures the heterogeneity implied by a certain contract within a certain group within a certain class. And the famous example in um, educational sciences is always like, if you look at the, the scores of a student, yeah, then that score is driven by the student because it can be a very good student or a not so good student, right? 
but the score of the student is also driven by the class he belongs to because there can be a lot of rumor and a lot of noise in the class, etc. And it's also driven by the school he goes to because the school can, well, it can be a very good school or, uh, yeah? So that's the different levels of, of heterogeneity which are being um, structured in these hierarchical or uh, multi-level models. That's the idea, okay? But for the theory, we're only gonna do this thing. And why is that? Because here I can do things analytically. If I'm working in the Poisson Gamma setting, I can do stuff analytically. The more levels I get, the more I will have to rely on a full Bayesian implementation with MCMC in order to, to do the estimation of the, uh, of the different uh, effects. A Bayesian, or you can go for uh, the mixed models, um, the mixed models framework that you may have encountered in a, in a course with Professor Verbeek or Professor Molenbergs who uh, teach on that. Um, so what I, what I want to say is I can do things analytically and, and um, work out the details in the simple setting, but the more levels I get, the more I will have to rely on the dedicated estimation framework to, um, to work on this example. Does that answer your question? All right, um, what are we gonna do? Uh, we'll, we're gonna do a bit of math. So we're gonna assume uh, Ni with this bullet here is the sum of the NITs. And lambda I with this bullet is the sum of the lambda ITs. So in words, this would be the total observed claims, claim numbers for my policyholder I over time. And this would, would be what I would have expected for him to happen based on my a priori tariff table, yeah? So that reveals me interesting information. And the first thing we can show that in the Poisson credibility model, the predictive distribution of theta i depends only on the total number of claims reported. Yeah, so not about there is, uh, it does not depend on the uh, precise path or the precise history, let's say, it only depends on the total number of claims uh, being reported. And now I could ask, yeah, from a commercial point of view, that's not so interesting. Why not? Um, yeah, yeah, to a certain extent. And this also means like a claim that you reported 10 years ago would contribute in a similar way as a claim from last year. Right, so there is no like aging of, of the history taken into account in, in this setting. Of course, you can work with other assumptions and you can, you, you can do other stuff here, which we will not do because, once again, I'm only focusing here on, on the basic mathematical framework. Huh? So the aging is not taken into account. So let's try to uh, work a little bit on that ourselves or, or together. Um, because I want to give you a bit of a flavor of the kind of calculations you'll need to do here. And these calculations, they quickly get pretty long. That's why I put them together in a separate uh, document, which is already on, on Toledo, or maybe I forgot to put it on Toledo uh, yet. So I'm going to do a few of the calculations together with you, but I'll ask you to look at the extra documentation for the others. So what we, um, so this is the proof of property. Yeah, it's 3.1 in the book, I guess. Um, so what we want to do is we want to look at the distribution, the density of this thing. Agree? Yeah. We want to look at what's the distribution of my risk parameter, given that I know a certain history of claims for policyholder I. Be careful, theta is continuous. The ends are discrete. Uh, so it's uh, often a little bit, uh, I'm going to switch between a density and probabilities, because I've got continuous and, and discrete. 
So what do I do? I do base. Right, and if I do base, I can write it like this. Given that theta i is theta times my density. And I can be I will divide by the joint probability with these uh, ends. Okay. You'll have to pay good attention because it's uh, prone to typos. Huh? So whenever I make a mistake, um, give a sign pretty pretty quickly because otherwise I'll mess up uh, the whole derivation. So what can I say if I look at this um, if I look at this thing here? What can I say about this joint probability, given that I know the risk parameter? Then I can rely on my assumption of... So given the theta, these guys become independent from each other. That's one of the assumptions that I made. So given that I know uh, all these hidden characteristics, yeah, and then this probability can be written as a... Um, product of the, the marginal probabilities. So that's something I will do here. So I get this guy. Get something like this. And what am I going to do with the joint probability um, over here? I'm going to condition again, and I'm going to integrate over the density of theta just because that gives me a way to start working with this expression. Yeah. So we'll do the integral from 0 to plus infinity of the probability that n i1 given theta i is equal to, say, Psi, I guess that is in Greek, right? So I'm going to avoid using the theta again as the integration variable because I'm already using it on, on in the um, expression on top. So that's the law of total probability. Yeah. And of course, when I'm conditioning, I can once again use the um, independence and I can also use the fact that I know that I'm dealing with um, a Poisson probability. Yeah, times then the F so this is something all together, voila. And I can do something similar here. The expression below. Yeah. F theta. Okay, let's put this one in brackets. So here we use, uh, if I know the theta, uh, these ends become independent from each other, they follow a Poisson. But in my Poisson, I'm going to use lambda it times the observed value for the risk parameter, right? And now I need to put uh, certain things together. So if it's, of course, a product of Poisson probabilities. Huh? I can uh, work a little bit with that. And I can see that that becomes the exponential of minus theta times the sum of the lambda it's over t. And then here I'll get um, theta to the power, the sum of the k it's over t. And then here I'll have the 
products of the lambda IT's to the power k IT divided by k IT factorial. And I've got my f theta evaluated in theta. And if I, I need to divide again by the integral from zero to plus infinity of the exponential of minus xi and then the sum of the lambda it's, xi to the power the sum of the k it's, and again I've got the product of lambda it to the power k it divided by k it factorial, and I've got my f theta evaluated in xi integrating over xi. So what do I see? That I've got something in common over here, and that drops out. So I get rid of that term. And you start to realize that what remains only depends on the sum of the lambdas and the sum of the k's, right? So you can see this as follows. You can say, okay, that is in fact that is in fact the exponential of minus theta times the lambda i bullet multiplied with theta to the power the k i bullet and then I've got f theta evaluated in theta divided by the integral from zero to plus infinity this like this yeah so this indeed tells me that this posterior distribution of theta given the whole history reduces to a posterior distribution of theta for which I only need to know what was the sum of the claims reported um, in the past. Yeah. So it tells me the following conclusion. And that was stated at the bottom of sheet 24. So that's what we derived uh, together. The probability of theta of a theta i being less than or equal to t, given the whole history of this policy holder, is going to reduce to um, the probability of theta i given the total sum of the claims. Yeah, so I don't need the exact path, I only need to know what was there, what was the total number of claims uh, observed. Good? It's okay for everybody? Okay. So I have the same derivations in a separate uh, PDF that I'll, uh, that, that is on Toledo or that I will put on Toledo. Yeah. So what are the consequences? As we already discussed, we disregard the age of claims and a penalty induced by an old claim would be similar to the one induced by a recent claim. We don't distinguish between the recent, based on the recency of claims. And of course, commercially, that may not be such a good idea to do so 
that's also why we'll have this bonus malus scale um, who, where we will look only at um, allez, uh, where the number of claims reported in the previous period will determine the number of steps we take in a bonus malus uh, scale. So we call, or we're going to switch now to the so-called predictive distribution. So now we want to know something about what will be the number of claims in the next period coming up, given the history reported. And with similar derivations as the one I did on the, on the iPad, so now we can go a little bit faster because you, you saw the essential steps now. So what am I going to do here? Um, again, I'm going to do first the base rule. Look at the joint probability divided by the probability to observe this history. And then I'm going to condition on the risk parameter. Huh? So the conditioning here um, is happening, or in fact, the, the law of total probability is used here both in the numerator and the denominator. I bring in the theta and I integrate over the density of theta, over all val values that theta can take. And why do I do that? Because it's the only way to come up with a workable expression. Because if I can condition on the theta, then I can use my conditional uh, independence, and then I can write this um, joint probability as a product of the marginal conditional probabilities. And now there is a new guy coming in, because I'm using this guy in blue, uh, because I'm looking at this specific predictive distribution. And the guy in blue, what does it become? It's, of course, a Poisson probability, given that theta i is theta, so I get the following expression. Yeah? So this is very similar to what uh, we did together on the iPad. This is also made explicit in the extra note I will put on Toledo, but essentially I'm using steps which are similar to the derivation that we took together. Our prediction, our expression, sorry, for the, um, for the predictive distribution. So we'll look at the predictive distribution. Oh, oh, oh. which is the probability that the number of claims in the next time period is k, given the history of um, reported number of claims. That's our predictive distribution. And I know I, I skipped that uh, derivation because it's very similar to what we've been uh, doing previously. But I do want to show you what is like the final expression. If you take this step, you'll get something like this. From which we, or for which we know that it is uh, this part here, together with this part, which is new, uh, which is um, referring to what is happening in periods ti plus 1. And then I'll divide by the expression where I'll have the integral from 0 to plus infinity, the exponential of minus lambda i bullet, times xi, and then this xi to the power ki bullet. And then I'll integrate over the density of my risk parameter. So that's my expression for the predictive distribution. And the reflection I now want to make is that inside this expression, uh, we recognize, in fact, the density f theta, which we, for which we derived an expression on the 
previous uh, yeah I denoted gonna denote it similarly to here so theta given um, n i1 is k i1 up to n i t i is this thing so here we derived earlier on on the iPad that I can see it as follows. So what I want you what I want you to observe now is that this expression for our conditional density of the eta. Uh, and I should have used a different color for that, but we can indeed retrieve that in the above expression, right? So in blue, let me highlight those terms, which I recognize, which I already obtained here in this expression for the posterior distribution of the theta. So that I can see this predictive distribution as a, a Poisson mixture where I'm using as the mixing distribution this conditional density of theta given the claim history. Yeah, so that's my sort of final uh, observation here to make. So This leads me to an expression for my predictive distribution where I'm going to use the steps or the, the terms highlighted in, in red. So I'm going to do theta times lambda i e i plus 1 to the power k divided by k factorial. And then I'm going to say yeah, the, the, the density over which I'm integrating, that's in fact nothing but the conditional density. So it's the derivative of the distribution of theta given the claim history. Because this guy, what I have here, that's this expression in blue, which I also had here at the top of my expression. Yeah, so it's in fact, um, yeah, it's what we called in the loss models course a mixture of a Poisson. Uh, it's a mixture of a Poisson. We multiply the mean in our Poisson with a parameter theta, and we have a certain distribution for this theta. And in this case, that distribution for the theta is its conditional distribution of the risk parameter given the claim history that is reported. Yeah? So that's an important... Uh, first thing to, to realize. Okay. Now, at the end of the day, what do we want to know? We want to know what is I'll continue on a new, uh, a new sheet. We're interested in the predictive mean. Of n i t i plus 1. Given n i 1 up to n i t i. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I want to know what is the expected value of n i t i plus 1 given I reported a certain number of claims in the past. Because this is what we refer to when we do experience rating. In this case, um, tailored to a claim frequency setting.
Now I can look at that and I could say, yeah, what, are, what am I going to do? I'm going to use the tower rule. And I'm going to do an expected value over theta of the expected value of ni ti plus 1 given the theta and given the, the history. Now, given the um, given the theta, what I'm going to work with, if I look at the expected value of the ni ti plus 1, given my theta, then I know it will become lambda i ti plus 1 multiplied with uh, theta. And then I know I have to calculate this thing conditional on the history of claims being reported. Uh, because the, that conditioning was already there from, from the beginning on, so I still need to keep it. right? So that becomes lambda i ti plus 1 multiplied with the expected value of my theta given my claim history. And here I know I can um, write down the expression for this posterior mean of the theta. Yeah. So what that last part becomes the following. So I'll need to work with the integral from 0 to plus infinity of theta times the conditional density of theta. That's how I would calculate this conditional this conditional mean. Okay. And then I've worked with this um, expression earlier on, uh, so C um, yeah, infra, let's say, uh, so we already derived this conditional uh, density as one of our first steps. So if you would bring all of this together, you would have theta to the power ki bullet plus one, and the plus one is coming from the fact that I have this additional theta in this expected value multiplied with the exponential of minus lambda i bar times theta um, integrating over the density of theta and dividing by the expression we also had earlier on. Like this. Yeah, so that brings me everything I would need to know in order to be able to calculate the conditional, the predictive mean uh, of ni ti plus 1 via this conditional mean of the theta given the claim history.
So these calculations, okay, I can I can write them down and I can uh, get a bit of feeling um, like this. But um, what would be your next step now, or what would be your uh, what would what would we have to do in order to become a bit more concrete in these calculations? Uh, so they still remain quite quite general, and and why is that? What could help to make things very much more specific now? Any ideas, Jill? Yeah, very good. So what hinders us to, to become a bit more specific is that we are doing this for a very general distribution of theta. And no specific assumption there. Um, so this hinders us at this point uh, to make things more, more concrete. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make an assumption for theta, a very specific distributional assumption. And we're going to use a gamma distribution for that. And the reason is that if you work with the Poisson gamma setting, as we've also seen, I think, in the loss models course, then you can do certain analytic calculations. Yeah, So they're um, conjugate distributions, so they work very well together. If I'm mixing the Poisson with a gamma random effect, I can do, um, I can obtain some analytic closed form expressions. So that's what we're going to do. But for the distribution of theta, there were two, two things we, we wanted to keep in mind. We need a positive theta. Now that's satisfied if you go for the gamma because it has positive support. And we also want the theta to have a unit mean, right? Um, so how can we make sure that our theta is going to have a unit mean? What we're going to do is we're going to assume that this theta is taken from a gamma distribution with parameter AA. And so it's on purpose that we take these two parameters in the gamma distribution equal to each other, because then the expected value of theta is equal to A divided by A is equal to 1, as we want it to be. So that's the reason why I don't work with a gamma with parameters A and B, but why I really go for a gamma with parameters A, A. How could you... Estimate, um, how could you get a, an idea about what the value of this A should be for a given portfolio? You could um, go to this portfolio and you could estimate um, like as a general claim count model, uh, you could you could play with this mixture of Poisson and Gamma. Uh, so you could calibrate such a mixture, which turns out to be a negative binomial distribution then, and uh, you could calibrate that on the portfolio and as such get a bit of a feeling of what this A value should be. Uh, so calibrating a negative binomial will give us this additional parameter, which you which we will see is connected or is, is really leading us to an estimate for what this A parameter can be. So that's a bit of a pragmatic ad hoc approach. If you would really do it in the Bayesian sense, you would uh, allocate a prior distribution to this, um, to this A parameter as well, and you would do the full um, MCMC calculations. Yeah? But let's uh, focus here on um, what we can learn now when we make things more specific by assuming this this gamma density okay now first of all what I need then is a reminder if X is following a gamma with parameters a and B then the density of X or I will use uh, I will use the following specification uh, 
something like this, right? And we know that this also leads me to the following integral expression, which we'll often need in the derivation. So x to the power a minus 1, e to the power minus bx integral over x. That should be equal to gamma evaluated in a divided by b to the power a. And because if I take the integral of the gamma density, I should get 1. So if I ignore these uh, two constants over here, and I take my integral expression, then I should get the inverse of these, these two constants that I get over here, right? So this, this should be uh, an equality, and I will need that because I'll often be faced with integrals of this, this type. Yeah? So you need to take this relation into account. Okay, so uh, let's try to, to make things a bit um, more specific. And we're going to focus first on the posterior distribution of the theta. Given the claim history. Yeah? So my hope is that by assuming this gamma, I can now get an expression that I really can recognize, uh, that I get some intuitive closed form expression, right? So of course that will not come for free. I'll need to do the work. Uh, so I'll focus on this thing. And using The same kind of reasoning as before. So given theta is theta, multiplied with the density of theta. And then this guy, where I'll have the integral expression. Mm, yeah. Voila. So what I'm, I can do now is I can use the independence of the of the ends mm, and their Poisson distribution. But now, of course, I've got a very specific density to to use for the density of theta, uh, and I'm gonna do my my gamma density that I had um, earlier on. So let's see what we get. So that's the exponential of minus theta times the sum of the lambda it's. I've got theta to the power, the sum of the k it's, sorry. And I've got now, because I'm dealing with a gamma density, I have theta to the power a minus 1. Yeah. I've got the exponential minus a times theta. I've got a to the power a divided by gamma, gamma a. I'm already dropping a term that, that cancelled out, um, that will cancel out in the numerator and the denominator, um, as we've seen in our very first derivation on, on the iPad, right? That would be the product of the lambdas to the power k divided by k factorial. Uh, I'll have that both in the numerator and the denominator. So I'm going to divide then by the integral from 0 to plus infinity. And 
minus xi times the sum of the lambda i, lambda i t's, sorry, um, multiplied with xi to the power, the sum of the k i t's. And now I've got the density of theta evaluated in xi. So that's going to be again a to the power a divided by gamma a times xi to the power a minus 1 e to the power minus a times xi. Something like this. So you'll see that we don't need these guys. They will cancel out. And we see that we can now take a lot of things together. Namely, we'll get the exponential of minus theta multiplied with the sum of the lambda i t's plus a. We'll have theta to the power the sum of the k i t's plus a minus 1. And we're going to divide by the integral from 0 to plus infinity the exponential of minus xi sum of the lambda i t's plus plus a, yes, times the xi to the power a plus the sum of the a i t's minus 1 d xi. Yeah? So you can make it more explicit by looking at the gamma density. What would you do now? Can you see it? So now here, if I look at this expression, We've got an integral of an exponential, exponential function in this xi, right? I've got xi to a certain power and I'm integrating over xi. So that reminds me of the property I have over here from my gamma. You see? So now I can identify uh, who's going to play the role of the a, who's going to play the role of the b, and I can write the integral as the gamma function evaluated in a and then b to the power a. Well, that's what I'm going to use here, right? Um, so let me see how to write that uh, down. So if we look at the... expression over here. So that thing is equal to our gamma function evaluated in a plus the sum of the k i t's. divided by, now I have to take the uh, b, so that would be the sum of the lambda i t's plus a to the power a plus the sum of the k i t's. That's what I, yeah, that's what I need. And putting it all together, I'll get the following expression. And remember, this is for the posterior distribution of the theta. So putting it all together, I have the exponential of minus theta, sum of the lambda i t's plus a. Then I've got theta to the power of the sum of the k i t's plus a minus 1. And I'll bring this a plus the sum of the lambda i t's to the power a plus the sum of the k i t's over here. And I'll divide by the gamma function evaluated in a plus the sum of the k i t's. Okay. 
What is this? I don't know things. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> what is this? Kind of density. Bruno, sorry. Ah, no, not yet. We'll come there, but not yet. Jill? The gamma again, very good. So it's a gamma with parameters A plus the sum of the reported claims, and the other parameter is A plus the sum of the expected number of claims. Yeah, very good. So if you look back at my definition of the gamma, which I had earlier on, uh, you recognize this... Um, well, I can, uh, I can copy it, huh? uh, because a gamma with parameters A, B has density, 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 B to the power A, gamma of A, X to the power A minus 1, E to the power M minus beta X. And that's exactly what uh, we have over here. But of course, the role of the X is played here by the, by the theta. So I've got theta to a certain power, minus 1. I've got the exponential of minus theta times a certain power. I've got the gamma function, and I've got this, um, yeah, this b to the power a kind of thing. So I have a gamma distribution. I've got something that I know. So my conclusion, in general, under the assumption of a gamma distribution for my risk parameter, I can say that its posterior distribution is gamma distributed again with these parameters. Yeah, That's my general setting now. Now, of course, um, I can directly dive to the thing I'm interested in. I can do a long way or I can do a very short way. Let's do the short way and let's leave the long way for, um, for you to read at a later stage. So what we're interested in now is the posterior prediction. That's, uh, in fact, that's the whole, the only thing I'm interested in. Huh? How should I, which premium should I charge for the next period, given that I know the the history of my um, of my policyholder? And we know because of this tower rule, huh, where we would say it's an expected value of an expected value of n i t plus one given theta i, and then the history. So that's what we had earlier. So we know that this becomes lambda i t i plus 1, what I would charge based on my a priori tariff, multiplied with the expected value of the theta i, given the n i, given the claim history. And now, of course, I can do one extra step because I know that this guy is following a gamma distribution with parameters, um, what was it again? With parameters A plus N I bullet and A plus lambda I bullet. And given that I know what's the expected value in such a uh, gamma distribution, I can see that the whole thing becomes lambda i, oops,
Lambda i alif. Ti plus 1 multiplied with a correction. And that correction is a plus n i bullet divided by a plus lambda i bullet. So this is my credibility correction. If I'm willing to make a Poisson assumption for my random risk parameter, and this would be my a priori baseline. Agree? And can you now give some intuition for this cor correction? Bruno? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you get a discount. Yeah. Okay. So what this correction is driving, besides the A, which is a parameter that we need to calibrate, is the, the claims you reported actually compared to what we expected you to report historically, right? Based on the a priori assessment that we did. So if these two would be on par, then this correction coefficient would be equal to one. We wouldn't make a correction because we say, yeah, we assessed you a priori the way it should be, so we're not going to make any correction to our a priori uh, expectation. But if, like Bruno says, if this n, n bullet, huh, so the, the history of claims that you reported, if this, this is going to be larger than the lambda bullet, what we expected for you based on our a priori tariff, then this guy will become larger than one and you'll get a penalty. Right? Because we said, yeah, based on your history, we in fact charged not enough in our a priori tariff, so we're going to make, uh, we're going to assess, um, we're going to give you a penalty. Or the other way around, if you're doing way better, uh, if the n bullet is smaller than the lambda bullet, you'll get a discount because apparently we charged you too high in the a priori tariff uh, table. So that gives a bit, or that brings us to an intuitive expression, thanks to the gamma distribution that we made and the fact that we can analytically now uh, come up with this uh, posterior, sorry, with the pred predictive uh, expectation. If interested, uh, you can also look at the, not just the expected value here, but you can look at the predictive distribution of the NITI plus one given the history. And that's where the negative binomial comes into play. So if you would do these steps, but it's a lengthy uh, derivation, so I'm not going to do that on the iPad, but you can see it in the extra notes. So if you go beyond the expected value and also want to have the full distribution, you'll see that that becomes a negative binomial um, distribution. So that's nice to uh, observe as well, that you'll have this negative binomial, and if you take the expected value of the negative binomial, you'll get this expression. But if you're only interested in the expected value, you can also do the tower rule and quickly come to the interesting uh, expression. Yeah, There's one uh, final consideration I want to make about these posterior corrections. Uh, so Bruno already highlighted the immediate um, uh, intuition. There are two other things we can look at. And that's the following. So let's compare now two policyholders. So we take two different profiles. Uh, and I1 is the less risky profile. Yeah? So you take two policyholders. I1 was assessed less risky than I2 in the a priori tariff. And then we'll look at the corrections that they get if they don't report any claim. So their n bullet is zero. 
So then, because lambda i bullet, i1 bullet, is smaller than lambda i2 bullet, the discount um, uh, uh, so will multiply. So these are their correction factors, right? So what we see is we get correction factors um, below below one, but the one we attach to driver i1 will be higher, larger than the one we attach to driver i2. So we give here, for example, 95%, and then here would be 90% or something. So we see that the a priori worse driver the one with profile I, I2, will get more discount because we multiply his a priori ter tariff with 90%, which is a larger discount than the 95%. So why would that be? Bruno? Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, we made a, a bigger mistake a priori for driver I2 compared to I1. Huh? With driver I1, we already assessed him or her in, uh, yeah, closer to their actual riskness. So in order to restore this actuarial fairness, we need to give a bigger discount to the a priori worst driver because there we were making a, the largest mistake huh, in, in the a priori tariff. So that's a bit of intuition I want to give. And the other way around, what if they report a certain uh, K claims? And then you'll get the ordering um, in, in this way. So then we'll give them a penalty, but the penalty we'll give to driver um, I1 then will be larger than the penalty we give to driver I2. For the same reason, because we made a bigger mistake for the driver I1 by assessing him or her uh, with a smaller a priori tariff compared to driver I2. Yeah? So that's a bit of intuition I want to I wanna give, um, and which we can now write down in analytic form because we make this gamma assumption. Yeah? So that's very convenient. So here you see the thing about the negative binomials. So that's the last step in the extra notes, which I will kindly ask you to look at yourself. So we come up with a negative binomial distribution. We can look at the, uh, this, the, the mean from this negative binomial and you'll get exactly the same result as uh, before, right? I'll skip this, you can take a look at it because that idea of weighted averages that in fact comes back here uh, by rewriting the credibility, um, yeah, the whole updated credibility premium with a weighted average over here. You can, you can take a look at that yourself. This is nice, and I'm going to ask you to take a look at it. So these are a couple of examples from the book. So we start with an a priori tariff. We have a certain lambda a priori. And then we're going to calculate these correction factors over time periods. Uh, where we say, yeah, what if you only have one time period available and you reported zero claims in that time period or five claims? You'll see the corrections here being coming up. Yeah? So this is for an example, just to see a little bit how that goes. Um, this is for an a priori good driver, for an a priori average driver, and for an a priori bad driver. So here you also see that the corrections are larger. So the um, the, the discount uh, is going to be larger for the bad driver who reports zero claims compared to, for example, the average driver who reports um, zero claims. Yeah? So there you see the same phenomenon, but now actually calculated uh, on an example. Okay. What is also insightful is, yeah, I, I cannot say this out loud, but if you type the title of this book, you'll find the full PDF of the book uh, um, in an illegal way. Uh. But if you then look at this table 2.4 and 2.7, there they discuss the calibration of the a priori tariff and also the calibration of this A parameter from the, from the gamma 
under what they call the portfolio A in this book. So if you want to see how they come to their estimate of this A parameter in the gamma uh, distribution, then I kindly ask you to, to look at chapter two, more specifically the discussion of these two tables, to see where they get their a priori tariff and their um, initial estimate for the A parameter. And then having these two pieces of information, you have the analytic formulas to, to calculate these a posteriori credibility corrections. And then you see it happening here for three different profiles and then different uh, paths of, of claiming history for these profiles. From a commercial point of view, this would be way too severe to implement in uh, reality. Yeah? So it's a bit of a, a mathematical setting. How would you translate this into a commercial setting? That's what the bonus malus scale is doing. Yeah? So we really see the bonus malus with its uh, transition rules, with its um, coefficients that, that come with it. We see that really as a commercial alternative for this credibility kind of uh, thinking. 